So in the past month, we've seen the deadliest fire in California history, where as of yesterday, 88 people had been killed and 200 were still missing. In addition to that, 19,000 buildings had been destroyed, most of those being people's homes. So I think that what you're trying to do with One Concern is really interesting because it's using technology to address disasters like the one in California. And it's particularly poignant now given the disaster we've seen and the destruction we've seen there. So Nicole, I want to start off with that and talk about this specific example. So if I'm someone who lives in the fire area in California, mm -hmm. how can One Concern help me? Uh, so Fire Concern, which is our One Concern wildfire product, mm -hmm. uh, is an advanced development. Uh, it's not commercially released yet, mm -hmm. uh, but my team is actively working on vigorous validations to ensure that when we do release it, it is as accurate as possible, and we are sharing those outputs with fire experts on the ground, uh, okay. and our hopeful release is early 2019 next year. Mm -hmm. But the issue right now is pretty grave, uh, grievous, uh, and Fire Concern wants to answer two main questions. The first question is going to be, where is the fire right now? And the second question is going to be, where is the fire going to go? Now, you might wonder uh, the question, where is the fire right now? It's such a simple question. Why is that not answered right mm -hmm. away? Uh, we need to understand that fires are progressing really fast, sometimes at 60 miles per hour. And meanwhile, you're getting this half a side information in, and by the time the information even comes in, what happens is it's already not useful. Uh, sometimes uh, firefighters have to go all the way and just do paper maps or mm. static aggregated maps. And, that can, and just because of that, you cannot answer even that first question, which is where is the fire right now? And that leads to a lot of uncertainty in decisions like, who should I evacuate now? What sort of resources do I need to preposition? And that leads to all this chaos constantly. Mm -hmm. So with one concern, what we'll do is every 30 minutes, first answer that question, give you a near real time understanding of where the fire is going towards so that you can make those decisions. And once we are able to accurately answer where the fire is now, that's when we can more accurately answer where is the fire going to. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, and so when you're able to forecast that in a time series, then you can understand just what the decisions could be ahead of time as well. So. Right, so the graphic we have here on the screen shows how the fire is moving over time. Yes. And I remember hearing that with the campfire situation, we were looking at the fire moving a football field yes. in 60 seconds. Yeah. So how quickly are we talking, being able to tell people where a fire is? Yeah. In the car fire uh, for, our, for our model, we were able to figure out that the fire started just five minutes after the incident even happened. Uh, the Tubbs fire is another example wherein we've done more tests. Mm -hmm. And we were able to predict 36 hours before any fire perimeter map was present on a half an hour basis where the fire is progressing. And because you can see that, you can even do things like, let's evacuate these people in a particular neighborhood. It's a little scary, actually, because you see mm. the city getting engulfed. And right. the fact that you know uh, you can do so much there, but just, just sending that information across. Uh, yeah. So when we're talking about cities preparing for disasters, what do you think they do well, and what can they do better? So uh, c cities are more and more understanding that you know disasters are not just uh, issue to lives and livelihoods. Mm -hmm. It's also actually a long-term uh, economic and financial uh, issue. So they are investing in innovative, resilient solutions. And so if you look at there are several cities which have chief resiliency officers or you know long-term mitigation plans. Uh, but we can do all of that so much better. I think the underlying issue of lack of situational awareness is is a problem. So. Uh, where one concern comes in is that we are a holistic resilient solution. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, the response part is pretty clear, and we do multi-hazard. But we can do so much more before in the disaster. So what I mean is, instead of saving just one life in a disaster through response, we can do efficient execution, expert planning, and actually even hope to decrease that loss in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so by preparedness, it would just be realistic drills, sort of run several scenarios, get all the departments on the same page, and actually execute well before the disaster strikes. And by mitigation, I would mean things like, what sort of policies do I need to do? How do I get the most bang for my buck with a tax dollar effort? And how do I invest in the infrastructure uh, in my city? Yeah. I think infrastructure is a really important part to think about. We always hear these scary stories about the state of infrastructure in the US currently. Yeah. How do you consider that when you're making your models? 
uh, so infrastructure is actually a big portion of our models. It's actually one of the several components we look into while predicting impact. Uh, the unfortunate uh, part of infrastructure, there's, there's two ways you can sort of help it. One is we already have invested a lot of money in infrastructure. So sure. what can we do to do better there? Okay. Uh, disasters are a ticking bomb. It can happen anytime. We need to do something right away. And could this be like retrofitting of a particular building? Could it be elevating a particular neighborhood in a flood? How do you make those decisions well? So that's one part. Mm -hmm. And the second part is, where do I invest in new infrastructure? Okay. And you need to look at this from multiple different angles. It doesn't, uh, you need to look at, OK, is this particular neighborhood having a really large need for a food infrastructure or a healthcare infrastructure? And what can I do to immediately invest in that? Because these are really long projects. And we need to figure out what are the best places we need to strate strategically add these infrastructure. So that's how I think about it. So most of One Concern's current clients are cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco. But I'm interested in focusing on the private sector as well. How can companies or enterprise clients use your data, and what role should they be playing in disaster management? Uh, so disasters happen to cities. Uh, it doesn't happen to government. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to find a way for private sector and governments to work together, because only then can you actually say that a city is resilient. Say mm -hmm. the government does everything possible, but the private sector is unable to recover. It still affects the city a, a big deal. Mm -hmm. So we are actually in the midst of working with creating what we call a resilient network between public sector and private sector. And for private sector in particular, the issue is the same. Like mm -hmm. there's growing risk, there's growing uncertainty. You have a lot of offices distributed globally. Supply chain is distributed. How do we even figure out we, where are the vulnerable points? And if those vulnerable points break down, how is it going to immediately affect my downtime? That's one part of it. And if the downtime happens, I'm no longer able to provide the services to the citizens around me. And that's a big concern. Mm -hmm. The second part is obviously this life safety part. How do I keep my employees safe? Do I know whether they can come to work, et cetera? So that's sort of what we want to answer, just the situational awareness component of private sectors. And it's imperative to understand that the private sector and the public sector have to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. because. The downtime is sort of shared between both. So how do they sort of understand dependencies? Things like, is the food going to be up? Is, am I going to get power? Uh, is right. the, is, if the water shut down, when will I get it back as soon as possible? Uh, and vice versa as well. When will the private sector be able to give back sort of jobs or you know, have healthy sort of day-to-day um, -day life cycle uh, uh, for the cities? So. So I think it's really important when we're talking about disasters and emergency preparedness to talk about climate change. But before we get there, I'm, I'm curious to ask the audience, has anyone here ever been directly impacted by a natural disaster? Raise your hand. Wow, I really thought there would be more. Um, OK, let's change it up then. Let's, <laughs> let's do a polling question instead. Um, so if you can take out your phone and go to TYA, 2018.app, if you don't already have it up. And look for the live polling icon on the bottom of the screen. And the question is going to be, do you think that climate change has led to an increase in natural disasters? And your options are, one, strongly agree, two, somewhat agree, three, somewhat disagree, or four, strongly disagree. And so, Nicole, it looks like we have some responses coming in, but you work in this area every day. What, do, what would you expect to see from the audience on this? Yeah, I, I, I'm seeing what, uh, what I expect. It, mm -hmm. it is a big factor. Climate change is a big factor to disasters. And mm -hmm. disasters are exacerbated by a lot of stresses, urbanization, globalization, uh, climate change. And so we need to understand sort of like what can we do to uh, prevent this right now? Uh, how do we sort of personalize these longer term effects in the shorter term uh, uh, sort of shocks and mm -hmm. present that to the citizens. The second thing is also it's not about creating fear. It's about figuring out what the solution is. So right. when you're able to sort of plug and play that, hey, let's add this particular policy, let's retrofit these particular buildings, and let's see that change, that's mm -hmm. the way like we sort of should think about climate change. So I have some information I want to pull up on the screen, I can, um, about climate change and natural disasters. I'm sure you all were very interested in the national climate assessment that came out last week. Mm -hmm. What stood out for, me, for you from that report as most important or something we should really be looking at? I think the, the worry is that these things are becoming more and more frequent. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, 
unfortunately, sometimes 100-year floods are potentially going to be 50-year floods soon. This frequency is increasing really bad. And this is another thing which I'm also worried about is that what if you start having disasters which cities have never seen before happen in a particular area? Mm. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, you know, one concern actually started with such an event. Uh, my uh, CEO and friend Ahmed was stuck on his roof in Kashmir for seven days because of a devastating wow. flood. Uh, but Kashmir hadn't seen floods for several hundred years, uh, so hundreds of years. And now it's happening on a daily, on a yearly basis. And that's pretty frightening because the infrastructure is no way capable of, uh, you know, right. working against these floods. And that's something which is very scary to me that as, as and when this is changing, what do we do to make sure we are uh, fighting against uh, disasters? I think that's a really important part to talk about with this, where we're seeing increasing number, different types, increasing intensity of these kinds of weather events. And so I wonder, how do you protect against future threats mm -hmm. when past models may no longer apply to mm -hmm. what we're looking at? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's where an AI comes in. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a lot of great research done just in the natural phenomena sciences, in floods, in hydrology, hydrodynamics, et cetera. Uh, but the issue is that it's very painstakingly, it's a painstaking process to calibrate and tune these models. And say you have a new breakthrough research that, hey, this feature actually correlates to impact. It's very hard to sort of bring that back into the right. physical model space. So that's where and we believe AI is very useful. You can quickly add in multiple different features and constantly sort of tune yourself towards a historical event. Uh, we need to understand that we, with AI, we, need to, we can always validate and see how we're doing. Uh, uh, my team actually deployed to Indonesia as mm -hmm. well as in Mexico to even collect information during the earthquakes as to how the infrastructure performed. And then what we do is that we take those models, see on see how well they perform, and if they're not performing well, what are the localized issues that we have? You know, we we missed out. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a constant process. And yeah. is there a certain kind of disaster that you think we'll be seeing more of in the future, given climate change? I think it depends on the city, mm -hmm. uh, but I do believe that if we don't act now, mm -hmm. uh, it's unfortunately becoming uh, going to become much and much larger issue. And like I said, uh, it can become to a point that you start seeing disasters you didn't even expect. So that would be unfortunate. Yes. I think when we're talking about climate change, we also often ask, what can we be doing? Or what should we be doing differently? Mm -hmm. Does your data show you anything on that that we should be changing? Uh, so we work with cities mm -hmm. uh, and Preferably, it's not just about the response. Uh, we want to be de deployed before the disaster strikes. So ideally, when you deploy in a city, we take two to three months. We work with the chief resiliency officer or the emergency manager. We understand the infrastructure, the dependencies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then we run through a series of different scenarios, which mm -hmm. is the preparedness drills, so that we can understand what the dependencies are and how to improve upon their actions. But we also help in terms of policy making, which is like, do I need to change my seismic building code? Do I need to help this particular neighborhood? So a combination of those two can help you sort of, one, reduce the loss, and two, if there's a loss, how do you fight against it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when I spoke with you a few weeks ago, you had mentioned to me that one of the primary goals of One Concern was to drive deep social impact. What does that mean for you? So when our One Concern is saving lives. Uh, that's the that's short thing. Uh, and we hope that a few years from now, we have that single metric. And that metric is going to be the number of lives we act, uh, saved or the number of livelihoods we affected. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is that bring this back to the communities. We're, we're very worried that it's not just going to be the average population which gets affected. Disasters will actually make it worse for vulnerable population and worsen existing conditions which are already present in cities. So right. we want to ho hopefully help people understand that, hey, these are the actions you do ahead of time so that we can prevent this in the first place. So looking at 2019, what's up next for you? Where do you want to go? Uh, so we are launching fires. Uh, okay. We just recently launched floods uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, and we want to create the single multi-hazard platform wherein you can do before, during, and after disaster analysis. Uh, we are also launching into the private sector and creating resilience networks so that the public sector and private sector are on the same page. Mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately, our goal is to help create this resilience score, which is helping cities understand that this is where I am right now, mm -hmm. and this is where I need to be, and sort of use data-driven methods of showing this is how I can improve myself. Nicole, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you.